unto our feet and a light unto our path. This day as we open your word, let our hearts be open to all that you have to say to us. Amen. So before we're seated, if you'll just join me in saying the Lord's Prayer. And a prayer of offering for what's given today. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice in this day. It is a gift you've given us, Lord. May we cherish each moment with each other, put aside our grievances, and love one another. Amen. And the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in the heavens, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so upon the earth. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Welcome, you can be seated. In a moment, we'll have a talk for the children, but before we do, I'll have Paul come up with the reading, and as he's coming, take note from Mark and the Messiah. This month, the message is called, Your Spiritual Battles Will Lead You to Lasting Victories, or subtitled, Don't Fight Your Battles Alone. The reading is from the book of Mark, <coughs> chapter 4. And the same day, when the even was come, he saith unto them, Let us pass over unto the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him, even as he was, in the ship. And there were also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep, on a pillow. And they awake him, and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose, and rebuked the wind, and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why? Are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? And they feared exceedingly, and said one to another, What manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? Thanks, Paul. Jesus said, when we come to him and we hear his words and obey them, we are blessed. So, we've got most of the young people here up the front already. I think there's a small group. we prepare to talk to the children this morning, take note from the reading that was beautifully read by Paul there, a few key points that stand out. This is the second time that the Lord has called his disciples into a boat only to find they end up in a storm. Last time the Lord sent them on their way into the boat and he went up a mountain, but this time the Lord is present in the boat. But where is he? He's asleep at the back of the boat. This is such a challenge for us as we learn to walk for the Lord, to not fall asleep to what's going on around us. Here's a picture of Elijah and the false prophets. You can't see it there, but if the picture continued, there'd be a whole array of these false prophets to the side. 400 in total, 400 false prophets. And what Elijah's doing here is he's putting a challenge to them. He set up an altar and he said to them, where is your God? Call down your God and ask him to light this sacrifice on fire. And then I'll call down on my God and we'll see who the real God is. Now the false prophets, they began to cry out over hours. This went on for quite a while. Hours. They became desperate. They even began to cut themselves, thinking maybe somehow this could maybe get the attention of their God. And then I love how Elijah sort of says, hmm, what's wrong? Where is your God? 
Is he on the toilet? Has he left? Maybe he's asleep. He sort of kind of mocks him a little bit. Then it says he calls out to God, the Lord Jehovah. God, hear me this day and light this fire. And when this fire lights up, it lights up from heaven. Even some of the rocks begin to melt. The ground around is left just for, like a pit from the intense heat of God answering the fire. It doesn't quite tell us, but then Elijah ends up in a fight with these 400 prophets and beats them on the spot. It's an amazing story. We're then told, this is where it gets really, really interesting, that Elijah is so excited about what's happened, what God's done. He's going to deal with the bad king and the bad queen of, Jerusalem, of Israel. The bad king, his name is Ahab. Can anybody guess what the bad queen's name might be? Ah, there's someone. He's been listening down the back there. Jezebel. Don't we all know that name? Ooh, Jezebel. It even got a, it's even got a, a sound to it, doesn't it, Gay, that kind of almost gets stuck in your throat, doesn't it, when you Jezebel. It's sort of like, <laughs> here comes trouble. She was trouble, and she had been actively going through the land and killing other true prophets of God. Elijah was a little too powerful in some ways for, him, for her to kill. But in this case, these 400 prophets that he took on, they were hers. And he was excited. So it says that Ahab sent men on horse to tell Jezebel what had happened. Ah, oh, picking a fight, are we? So on horseback, these men go to tell Jezebel what happened. Elijah, he's so excited, he runs and outruns the horsemen and he runs into the city and he's obviously going to bring some kind of a message to Jezebel maybe he was just so excited he was going to say they're dead and you're next but what happens is when he gets there he finds out that she already has a word for him and you think oh how did that happen and so Elijah is suddenly throw him backwards and goes, what's going on here? And he becomes fearful. So that's the part in the story here where Elijah thinks, oh, maybe I forgot to ask God about Jezebel and Ahab. And this is an important point to remember. They were kings. They were anointed by God. Bad kings and queens, yes, but they were anointed by God. And we have another story in the Bible later on where King David he has to deal with, he's not king yet. King Saul is, is king in his place. And King Saul starts trying to attack David. And David will not fight King Saul. He will, he's, I will not touch God's anointed. There's this understanding among the Israelites that if you're made king or queen, then I have to be respectful of what God has done here, even if you're a bad king or queen. So here's Elijah thinking, I have just run ahead of God. I got so excited. I ran ahead of the horsemen. I ran ahead of God. I was about to pronounce some judgment on Jezebel that God didn't say. Not a good thing to do. And he becomes very fearful. And Jezebel says to him, just like you killed my prophets, if you're not dead by tomorrow, then may my God kill me. Something to that effect. And Elijah becomes fearful. And this is what happens next. It says he takes off. He grabs his servant. He takes off. He runs to the edge of civilization. He gets to the very desert. He sends his servant away. And he says, he starts feeling very, very afraid and very sorry for himself. And it says he walks one day into the desert. He doesn't know what to do. So he just sits there feeling sorry for himself. And then an angel appears with food and says, Elijah, eat. You have a long journey ahead of you. So he eats and he goes to sleep. He gets up the next day. And for 40 days, he walks into the wilderness. 40 days. That's an interesting number, isn't it? 40 days. Jesus was also 40 days in the desert dealing with the devil. 40 days. He finally gets to Mount Horeb, climbs up there, finds a cave, and hides himself in the cave. He's feeling very sorry for himself. Who here can relate to feeling sorry for yourself? You know, you've had a moment where, where you've kind of maybe opened your mouth and said something and thought, gee... If only I could roll those words back. 
but they're out there now and my skin is itching, my face is turning red and I want to run away and hide in the cave. Sometimes when we're little we do that, don't we, if we find places to run away and hide. <laughs> Who's ever hidden under their bed? I mean, they were children once too. Who's ever run and hidden under your bed? Yeah, nearly every hand here goes up. It's kind of like a little cave, isn't it? You know, like a bed, <laughs> a little cave to hide under. No one will find me here, I hope. And that's what Elijah was hoping. No one will find me here, especially not Jezebel, because she's killed them all, and I've outstepped God, and I'm next. But that's where it gets really, really interesting. So here he is in the cave, and then the Lord sends an angel to him again and says, why are you here? I think I've got it here. No, it's not there. That's for the adults later on. Why are you here? And then the angel says, the Lord's going to pass by. Out you go. So he comes out of the cave and he pulls his cloak over him. There's a massive wind. The earth shakes. There's a big fire. A big fire blows through the valley. And then a very small, soft voice says, Elijah, why are you here? Come out from under the bed. You're not going to get in that much trouble. Come on, come out. And so Elijah comes out and the Lord says, go back, go back into Jerusalem, go back into the city, anoint this man king over the north, anoint this man king over Israel, anoint Elisha to be the next prophet, and trust me when I say, you are not the only one who's bowed the knee to Baal. I have at least 700 people, 7,000, sorry, people who've not bowed their knee to Baal and worshipping false gods. Off you go, there's nothing to be afraid of. And this is a, uh, such an important story for us because I can't say that I've done incredible things like Elijah's done, but I certainly can relate to feeling like sometimes where is God or what's he doing? What are you doing, God? Where are you? And feeling like I want to run away. And the message for us today is that we need to trust the Lord. We, we need to know that he's with us and we need to be sure of that. And when things go wrong, stand. Stand to be strong. Mm -hmm. let, let everything fall where it needs to fall and, and let the Lord be God for us. So would you bow your head and, and adults too and we'll pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we trust you with our very life. Help us to trust you, Lord, in our hard times. Let us not run away, but let us stand strong, knowing that you love us and you are with us. Amen. Amen. Yes. So we're going to talk to the adults now uh, in, in a moment after Holy Supper a little bit more about isolation, spiritual isolation. When's the right time to isolate yourself and when's not the right time to do that? But before we do that, if, if the children can stay in, Renee, and we'll just have Holy Supper. So let's prepare our hearts for Holy, Holy Supper. You'll see that there's a, a reading here on the back. may not have thought about this, but have you ever realized that Holy Supper is something that we do together? I mean, there's nothing wrong if, you, if your heart's led to. There's no rule saying you can't do this. If you're alone and you wanted to have a private Holy Supper with the Lord, you could do that. You could get some bread, you could get some wine, you could set a table, you could pray, and you could talk to the Lord. There's nothing saying don't do that. But there is definitely lots telling us that when we do take the table of the Lord, come together. Jesus said, where two or more are gathered, there I am in their midst. And when we look at Holy Supper in the Scriptures, we find it's usually done together around a meal. It's something that we are celebrating together as a body of Christ. Hopefully, before we come to the table of the Lord, we've taken a moment somewhere in our days, in our week, to be reflective to look over things, to be repentful where we need to be. But, but when we come to the table, it's now time to relax, to celebrate, to eat together as a body, as one family, to be strengthened by the bread and to be revitalized by the wine. It's something we do together. Would you come and read to us from Henry Newen's book,
had a number of books. I, I forgot the title. Which one was this one again, Ian? I wrote it down, didn't I? Oh, yes. Wisdom for the Long Walk of Faith. Thank you, Gay. <laughs> a block of marble cannot carve itself. It needs a sculptor. An athlete needs a personal trainer or coach. Likewise, a person of faith will certainly benefit from a spiritual director. A spiritual director can be called a soul friend or a spiritual friend whom we trust to offer wisdom and guidance. We need someone who helps us to distinguish between the voice of God and all the other voices coming from our own confusion or from dark powers far beyond our control. We need someone to encourage us when we are tempted to give it all up, to forget it all and to just walk away in despair. We need someone who cautions us when we move too rashly in unclear directions or hurry proudly toward a nebulous goal. We need someone who can suggest to us when to read and when to be silent, which words to reflect upon and what to do when silence creates much fear and little peace. Through the discipline of spiritual direction, we explore in the presence of another wise Christian companion or two, God's claim upon our lives, what has been and what may now be. Thank you. And how important it is for us when we come around the table of the Lord to do it together to know that we are one family, that we have friendship, we have companionship, we have each other to turn to in our difficult times. We eat the bread of being one family and we're strengthened and we drink the wine and know the Lord's thoughts and heart for us. So this morning, because we have Reverend Martin Pennington with us, I'd like to ask him to come forward and do a Holy Supper with us. On that faithful last night, the Lord took the cup and he lifted it to heaven and he gave a benediction. And then he turned to his disciples and he said, this is my blood shed for you. Drink ye all of it. And on that faithful night, the Lord took the bread to heaven and he broke that bread he said to his disciples after a, a benediction this is my body that has been broken for you take and eat tells us, Lord, taste and see that the Lord is good.
are so grateful, Lord, that you truly came into this world. You are the light of this world. If we will walk in that light, we will know your life. Amen. So as the children prepare to go out, <coughs> if you'll help me in singing the song, When a Knight Won His Spurs. I think most of us would know this one. When a knight won his spurs in the stories of old, he was gentle and brave, he was gallant and bold, with a shield on his arm and a lance in his hand, for God and for valor, he rode through the land, no charger Yet still to adventure and battle I ride. Lo, back into story land, giants have fled, and the knights are no more, and the dragons are dead. Let faith be my shield, and let joy be my steed, against the dragons of Rather exciting message, really, this is that we have this morning. As mentioned earlier, this is the second time we're encountering a story where disciples are gathering together into a boat and then are thrust upon with a storm. Only this time, the Lord is in our midst. Today we've gathered together as a body of Christ and we too are in a ship. We're in fellowship or you might say we're in membership. We're coming together to celebrate the Lord's presence. And like the disciples, we too want the Lord to be in our midst. Who can say to me that they want more of the Lord in their life? Amen. Amen. Every hand goes up. Who wants more of the inner sense of the word? I mean, it reveals the Lord to us. So therefore, who wants more of the inner sense? Then who wants more spiritual battle? <laughs> and no hair. Oh, the hands are going up. <laughs> well, maybe not. But this is the beautiful thing about the inner sense of God's word. It reveals to us the very the mechanisms, the mechanics of what the Lord is doing. And we discover some wonderful and encouraging truths. And the reality is, that when we get a right understanding of the Lord and how he's working, we welcome spiritual battle. We do. They're, they're exciting. They're liberating. They're encouraging. And we hold on to this greater peace that's going to be in our life, this greater nearness of the Lord that we're going to have as a result of the spiritual battle. It doesn't always feel that way as you're going into the battle. You know, I kind of like catch my breath. I'm, <gasps> here we go. I'm going into a battle, I've lost my peace. That's how I know that I'm going into a spiritual battle. Ah, oh, there goes my peace. And I'll go and pray. And I might spend sometimes hours praying, looking for that peace to come back. Now, if the peace doesn't come back, I'm going into a spiritual battle. Sometimes the peace comes back, and you go, well, what does that mean? Well, that means that the Lord was actually putting something upon me to pray for others. Does that make sense? If you, if you feel an uneasiness or a loss of peace, and then you go to pray, you don't even need to necessarily know who or what you're praying for, but just the very act of coming before the Lord and praying is helping to settle things out there for someone else. And the evidence that it's settled is you, ah, my peace has come back. Great, that's good. But if you find yourself 
not getting that piece back, well then put on your armor, strap on your sword, a horse if you have one, you're going to battle. And it's a good thing. But what are we learning today about choosing the Lord, about spiritual battles and what they do to us? Before we dive in, let's have a look at this passage here from Secrets of Heaven that says to us, in the Lord's kingdom, there are those who are external, those who are more interior, and those who are internal. Good spirits who dwell in the first heaven are external. Angelic spirits who dwell in the second heaven are more interior. And angels who dwell in the third heaven are internal. Those who are external are not as close or near the Lord as those who are more interior. And these in turn are not so close or near as those who are internal. There are many other passages we can read that tell us the Lord loves us and just longs for us to be near him. The very fact that there are three heavens is evidence of a different kind of love. The Lord says, I love you and want you near me, but I won't force my relationship upon you. I'll give each one their room to find their place. And when you realize that spiritual battles are the way we get closer to the Lord, you can understand why some people may be going, Oh, natural spiritual heaven doesn't sound too bad. I love you, Lord. I'll worship you from here. Doesn't it? You know, we, we can be Jonah running the other way because a battle is coming. Oh, not this again, Lord. And we run the other way. Spiritual battles. I want you to notice in the reading today, it said, they took him even as he was in the ship. From the reading. Last time this happened, they got in a boat and they got into a storm. The Lord was up in a mountain praying. And then he walked across the water to them and rescued them from the storm. This time, I can imagine them going, oh, no, 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 you're coming with us. We're not leaving you behind, okay? They took him as he is. On a more literal level, you could read into this and go, they just finished a massive campaign, mind you. And you could imagine, the scriptures are telling us, they took him as he was, tired, exhausted, you're not going away to get refreshed. You're coming with us. So he found a nice cushioned spot in the boat and he had a sleep. But, you know, there are so many stories that could have been recorded. This one gets in the word because it has that much deeper meaning. It's telling us that when you go into spiritual battles, you're going to feel like heaven is silent and you're going to feel like the Lord is not very near. Maybe he's even fallen asleep. Ever felt that way, Gay? Like you felt like you're in a battle and you go, <gasps> the irons of heaven when I pray, it's like it's not getting through. You know, what, what are you doing, Lord? Where is God when you need him? Where, where is he when you need him? He's asleep. Well, he's not. But what's happening here is warning us, encouraging us, and telling us that in order to pass through a spiritual battle, the Lord must withdraw. He must leave you in freedom to say, I'm going to stand. I'm not going to run. I'm going to stand strong and I'm going to fight this. So they took him, even as he was, into the ship. And today we've gathered together in our fellowship and our heart is to take the Lord as he is. Not water it down, not filter it, just everything the Lord has for us. But I promise that the more of the Lord we get, the more there are going to be storms. It has to be that way. And it will appear to you like the Lord is asleep. So when we talk about battles, does anyone, you know, earthly battles, does any, anyone come to anyone's mind here, like rather amazing figures in history? Go on, Chris, who's someone that you've even said that, people even said that you look like him? That's Napoleon. Yeah, there's Napoleon, right? We can, we can all, all of us here would pretty much know his main key strategy for fighting battles, isn't it? Like, would it be divide and conquer? That's right, yep, that's the one. Here it is, it says here, that N N Napoleon's tactics were to divide and conquer, split the enemy in two, flank them from one side. Now there's a couple others. The enemy will literally uh, halve in size after the one side is annihilated. And, and then you also have to search for gaps. Reconnaissance is to search for gaps, concentrate the artillery fire in these gaps, and then increase your artillery. But let's flip this on its head and say, the evil spirits in our life, or attacking us, are constantly in battle with us, and they want nothing more than to divide 
and conquer us, isolate us. They, will, they see us as far less a threat when it's one of us because where two or more are gathered, they've got to now deal with the Lord openly. And it's interesting here in this story of Mark today, the disciples have gathered together in a ship and that's when the storm happens. If the Lord hasn't let this happen to them when they're isolated and alone. They're together. And that's important. So we can learn from this a lot about the enemy and their strategy. Jesus said it this way. He said in Matthew 12, 25, every kingdom divided against itself is brought into desolation. And every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And we're talking about evil spirits trying to isolate us, spiritually isolate us, because physical isolation is good. It's really good in your spiritual walk. You should be having time regularly where you're disappearing with the Lord. Be it a walk, um, go to the forest, maybe close the door and have some reading. That alone time, physical alone time with the Lord is valuable. It's precious. But what we're talking about here is where the enemy wants to spiritually isolate you. Okay, so you're going through a battle, you've lost your peace, and you, and, and you, you know, if you get physically sick, it's intuitive, isn't it? You'll go and crawl into your bed, pull the blanket over and just say, oh, I'm just gonna get well, just leave me alone. And we all understand that, that's that physical isolation. But what the enemy wants to do in your crisis is separate you from those who can really help you. Now, I've already told you the Lord is asleep, or that's the appearance. The appearance is that I'm in my battle. God's gone. Where are you? I'm on my own. But you're not. We're not. We have brothers and we have sisters. We have, this is one of the great values of being a church, that we have each other. And each one of us should be finding, not everyone, but each one of us should be finding those that we feel safe coming to in that battle and saying, oh, Pray for me. Oh, cool. Pray for me. I'm in the middle of a storm right now. Pray for me. Someone that you can turn to that you know isn't going to judge you, that understands this is normal, this is healthy. They're not going to roll their eyes and say, Confess, what sin are you into now that this has happened to you? It's, that's not what's happening here. This is actually about the Lord bringing you through the valley of shadow of death into life. But, we, but it, it appears as if we're doing it on our own. And that's why he gives us each other. Did not the Lord send the disciples out two by two, didn't he? Never to be alone. We've got each other to turn to in that time and ask for prayer. Now, in the scriptures, it tells us in Ephesians, take up the shield of faith which, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take up the shield of faith. This shield of faith can extinguish every sh every arrow the enemy is throwing at us. Every arrow. But notice here in the reading today, the Lord asked two questions of the disciples in the middle of their battle. Two questions. And when the Lord asks you a question, he's not looking for information. He's not looking for an answer. He doesn't need your answer. When the Lord asks us a question, he's trying to send us on a quest. He's saying, search yourself. What were the questions? Let's have a look. He says here down to the third line from the bottom, why? Why are you so fearful? What's going on here? What's happened here that you're so fearful? Isn't it? If, if we can know God's for us and loves us, but when the battle happens, when you lose your peace, when you feel like the Lord's asleep or, or not near, it's just so easy for the fear to come up, isn't it? So the Lord's saying, why? What, what's the cause of this fear? And then he asks the question, how is it that you have no shield, no faith? He's saying, where is your shield? Where is your faith? And in the new church, we know what that means. How is it that you have no right understanding of the Lord and how he's at work in your life? That's what faith is. It's, it's a true spiritual understanding of what he's doing in your life. So, he has, so he's saying, where's your shield? Now, even the Romans get this one right, don't they? A Roman turtle. Now, why would they call it a turtle? Think about a turtle. It pulls its legs and arms and head in, doesn't it? Out of the danger. It, it pulls itself out of the danger zone, and the turtle hides itself under the shield. But here, you know, one shield's effective, but a lot of shields? Think about that, isn't it? The enemy's firing arrows on you in every direction. And here, when we have fellowship with each other, 
we're stronger together, we're safer together, and that's why the enemy likes to isolate us, to separate us. But there's some other reasons why the, the enemy likes to, to separate us as well. Have a look at this from Swinmore. Right. He says here, knowledge, however, must have a usefulness as its goal. So knowledge for the sake of knowledge alone, not good, especially in a spiritual battle. It's like David saying, you want me to fight with your weapons, Saul? I've never tried these. Come on. Just let me deal with the slingshot. Can you imagine David fighting a giant with slingshot? It's rather daunting, isn't it? But not for David. Here you are. You're David right now. You're about to fight Goliath. And I reach over and I put a Glock in your hand, a gun. Are you going to be afraid of Goliath? You're going to say, bring it on, because I know what this can do. Come on, you blasphemer of God, let's teach you a lesson. So for David, that's what these stones were like. He knew how to use them like a gun. He'd been fighting bears and lions. This was his weapon, okay? He wasn't afraid. But the, re but the reality here is that knowledge without use is, is like an unloaded gun. It's useless. Why? Because it makes you purposeless. And that's exactly why the enemy wants to isolate you. They take away your purpose. Let's read. He says, when it has usefulness, knowledge has usefulness as its goal, it has life as its goal. Since life has everything to do with being useful, because it has everything to do with purpose. If we do not acquire knowledge for the sake of a useful life, that knowledge lacks any importance because it lacks usefulness. Now, anyone here that's ever experienced their purpose in life will tell you you're going to have the worst day. You wake up in the morning after having a terrible day, and that purpose will get you out of bed, isn't it? You go, oh, but you have purpose. But if the enemy has isolated you, then they're robbing you of your purpose. And that's each other, right? Serving, loving each other. That's purpose. That's really where our purpose comes together. Okay, so the enemy wants to isolate us. Okay, what about this idea? Um, what if I told you the spiritual sense of God's word, Swedenborg says this in the writing, the spiritual sense of God's word almost exclusively has to do with temptation battles. Almost exclusively. Isn't that an interesting thought? Didn't know that. Almost exclusively, the spiritual sense is about our spiritual battles and how to win them. How to, that's important, how to win our battles. Right? Let's have a look at this. Angels are constantly defending us and deflecting the evil that evil spirits intend towards us. They even defend the falsity and evil we have in us because they know very well where we obtained the falsity and the evil from the evil spirits and demons. Continuing, we never produce anything misguided or wicked out of ourselves. It is the evil spirits with us who produce it and at the same time cause us to believe that it comes from us. Such is their benevolence. What is more, at the same instant that they are filling us with these things and making us believe this way, they are also accusing and condemning us. Ever had that experience? Uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I expect most hands to go up, right? Internally, I saw the hands going up. You're in a situation, your head starts reminding you of all the wrong things you did, have done, or whatever in this situation, and then your head starts telling you what a rotten person you are. Mm. No good, right? And I can promise you, you could have a really good day yesterday, and if suddenly you're in the middle of, of all this horror in your head of all your failures and how bad you are, it's amazing how we want to run the other way the moment we're confronted with our failures. Isn't it? You're confronted with your failures, and you can be the strongest, most confident person, and you'll feel like, um, I'm going to go and retreat here, and I'll get back to you later when I'm feeling better. Right? Imposter syndrome is what they call it. Imposter syndrome, where you don't want to be around people because you feel like an imposter. Okay. Moving on. Few people know much about spiritual battles, so let me tell and explain them briefly here. Evil spirits never fight against anything but what we love. The more passionately we love something, the more bitterly they will fight it. 
evil demons combat anything good that touches our heart. Evil spirits combat anything true that touches our heart. That's the difference between our intellect and our will. And he goes on to say, as soon as they become aware of something we love, no matter how small, or smell out anything dear and pleasing to us, they immediately attack and try to destroy it. In the process, they are trying to destroy the whole person because our life consists in what we love. Nothing could possibly give them more pleasure than to destroy us, nor do they ever stop trying. Okay, so this is something we need to realize. Basically, for the rest of your life, and it has been happening all along, evil spirits are there constantly attacking you. Constantly. And you go, hang on, Darren. That's not my experience. Yeah, I've been attacked. I've had some terrible attacks. But there's some really good times, isn't there? I have some nice quiet times and, and beautiful times. And yes, you do. Because of the Lord. Because of the Lord, you have those good times. He longs to give us the seventh day rest. Oh, you need a rest. Here, just sit here for a moment. Do you think the evil spirits stop fighting? Not a bit. They're more on fire than ever. It goes on to say, they will never stop trying, even if it takes forever, unless the Lord drives them away. What a good promise that is. The Lord is there driving them away for us. So let's go back to this idea of the inner sense. I've two more passages I want to show you here about the inner sense here, okay? About the Lord and the inner sense. First, the whole... Wor uh, the word's whole inner meaning has to do with the Lord and that everything in the word comes from him. We have a saying in, in Christianity, new level, new Challenge. devil. Yeah. It kind of rhymes. <laughs> new level. What was, it, what was yours called? Challenge. Yeah, that works. New level, new challenge. New level, new devil, isn't it? Why is that? What are we learning from the word here? New level means new love. When the word open starts opening itself, you start seeing the Lord in it. And I don't just mean things about the Lord. I mean, you're in the middle of a conversation with someone, right? Face to face. I'd be saying, G'day, Brian, how you doing? You look handsome today in that white... Oh, sorry. <laughs> you look handsome that, in that white there. And I'm looking in Brian's eyes, and suddenly I see the Lord looking back at me. Oh, Oh, I didn't expect that. It happens. He's inside each one of us. And he's not, you know, you're not the only one looking out those eyes right now. The Lord's looking out of those eyes right now as well. But this is kind of an unveiling process of seeing more and more the Lord in your life and in other people's lives. And you start to fall more and more in love with the Lord. New level. So what happens? The devils get more enraged. Not another love. Another. Kill it. Fight it, attack it, destroy it. And the more in love with the Lord we become, the more fierce they become. Mm. Okay. And it goes on to say, you know, Swedenborg goes on to say, from the Lord's early youth up to the last hour of his life in the world, the Lord's life was one continuous struggle and one continuous victory. Okay, so continuous struggles. I'm so thankful he went on to say and continuous victories as well because the Lord is our pattern. We're reading the word, it's opening itself to us to show us how to do this, how to do this walk, how to get into a battle and win, and not be trembling in the corner or trying to run away like Elijah, but standing bold like David saying, bring it on, I know what I've got in my hand here, bring it on. That's exciting. Okay, a am I there? No. But I use this test, you know, when, when a battle comes, I, I, I test within myself, did it take an hour, two, three, a day, a week, before that rose up in me, isn't it? And I went, ah, here's another battle. And truth is, as I, as I get older in the Lord, it's quicker and quicker, it's getting quicker. You know, usually hours now instead of days and weeks. I have been there for weeks, I promise you, weeks, like Elijah, hiding in the cave. Let's go there, let's have a look at Elijah for a moment. The higher your victories in God are, the lower the attacks are going to get. It's a principle, right? The higher the highs, the lower the lows will be because you're getting more of the Lord, you're getting more of love. And so that's just going to enrage the hells all the more. It's just part of the process. 
Okay, so let's have a look at what happened to Elijah. We, we talked to the children about it this morning, but I want to read carefully what happened there because there's an incredible message in here for us. A message came to Elijah from the Lord, and he said, Elijah, what are you doing here? Have you ever had that experience where you've been running away from something and, and the Lord taps you on the shoulder and says, w why? Why are, you, uh, why are you dealing with this problem in this way? Go and talk to them. Confront it. And often when you do, the problem dissolves, doesn't it? Mm. How often do you go, you go ring someone up and talk to them and they're like, you silly Billy, why didn't you ring me sooner? Or something like that. Or, or maybe you're not as honest with them. Maybe you just ring them and say, can I talk to you? And then you realise everything's okay. So what's going on here? What you're dealing with is the wind, the earthquake, and the fire. And none of them are from the Lord. They're all from the hell. But they're from the Lord coming near us that brings this up. Brings the storm up, brings the earthquake up, and brings the wind up. Let's have a look. Elijah, he says here, Elijah replied, Oh, Lord God, who rules over all, I've been very committed to you. The Israelites have turned their back on your covenant. They've torn down your altars. I mean, like God needs to know all this, right? You know, <laughs> What's going on in Elijah? He's having a pity party. And I don't begrudge him because I've been there many times. Oh, Lord, I've been so, so zealous for you. All right? He says, they put your prophets to death with their swords. I'm the only one left, and they're trying to kill me. Uh, it's just interesting to see this conversation unfold. So then here's what happens. To kind of make the point, uh, it says, the Lord God said, well, the Lord said, go out, stand on the mountain in front of me. I am going to pass by. I in other words, you're about to have a spiritual encounter, and it's going to involve a battle first, then you're going to have peace. Say after me, dear Lord, teach me to keep my eyes on you, especially in the storm, especially in the earthquake, and especially in the fire. Amen. It's about keeping our eyes on you. Listen, he says, the Lord approached a very powerful wind tore through the mountain, uh, tore the mountains apart. So it's such a strong wind, the mountains are being torn apart. But the Lord wasn't in the wind. Ever had that happen in your life? You know, things are kind of like, you know, you're praying to the Lord and the next thing is just things are just falling apart. Yeah. What is this wind? Yeah. It's, it's, wind is false doctrine, false teaching. It's all these wrong ideas we have about God. What are you doing to me, God? I'm not doing anything. I, I'm just trying to bring you closer to me. That's all. But, but what's all this stuff? It's inside you. I've got to get it out. <laughs> That's kind of what he's trying to say to us. This wind of wrong doctrines comes tearing the mountains apart. Right? But the Lord wasn't in the wind. Oop, I went, I pressed the button and I shouldn't. After the wind, there was an earthquake the Lord wasn't in the earthquake. After the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord wasn't in the fire. Now, earthquakes are when, when external things are changing in your life, right? And you've got no control over it. External things change, and you just deal. Okay, that's what an earthquake is. You just adjust. So we can often say, what are you doing, Lord? What are you doing here? And it's like, the Lord's not in the earthquake. But what about the fire? A fire can be all our, our, our deeper feelings and emotions. What did the disciples do when the storm came upon them today in the reading? Don't you... Sorry, what was it? Jumped in the kids. Yeah. yeah. Don't you care that we're suffering and dying here? Wake up! <laughs> Isn't it? You can imagine them grabbing him and saying... They on board and didn't jump up. Yep. They didn't isolate themselves from the ship. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. That's very, very true. But have you ever been woken up like that? You know, you're peacefully asleep and everything's wonderful and something's going on and people are like, <coughs> alarms are going off and you're like, you're coming to and going, what's going on? Like there's a chaos, there's a storm. So the disciples here are going through the same thing. Don't you care? But I love the way the Lord says, what are you fearful of? You know, and, and where is your faith? Where is our faith? You know, is God good? Or is God good? 
It can't be anything else. And, and the scriptures are showing us that th these things we go through are not because of him, they're because of us, and the hells that are with us. And that's really good news. God's not blowing your world over. He's not shaking it, and he's certainly not putting it on fire. He said, but the Lord wasn't in the fire, and after the fire, it was only a gentle whisper. And how often it is you want to hear God, and you can't hear the Lord because of the noise of the wind, because of the distraction of the shaking, and because of the heat of the fire, isn't it? And it's like, I just want to hear God, and I can't hear him. And the answer is, just wait the battle out. And this is something I've lived by. Don't make big decisions in the middle of a battle. Just don't do it. Just wait. Write it out. Let the dust settle. Hear the voice. Then make your decision. That's what you've got to do. And that's what happens here is that, you know, Elijah, then the voice says, Elijah, coming back to, you know, why, why are you here? What's this about? And he sends him back on the next mission, the next quest. Okay, I've got one more example before we close today. And it's one of my favourites. John the Baptist. You know, as far as Old Testament prophets go, Elijah was pretty impressive. Yeah? He rose people from the dead. Elisha did twice the miracles, you can count them in the Bible, that Elijah did. And yet Jesus, speaking about John the Baptist, said, of all the Old Testament prophets, he is the greatest. Now follow what the Lord's saying. He's saying, of all those under an Old Testament this guy's the best. But we have now come into a new testamentality, isn't it? We now know the Lord. We've seen him with our own eyes. We read about what he, he does. And it's different to what we thought. He's love. He's not the wind. He's not the shaking. And he's not the fire. He's a small, gentle voice saying, I love you. You are special and I love you. That's that small, still voice. But John the Baptist is the greatest of these Old Testament prophets. But not, he's the least of those that know the Lord in the way that we are to know the Lord. He goes on, John the Baptist goes on a great campaign, really calling people to repent, challenging them to get their life together. He makes a lot of enemies in doing this. He's not popular in his message of repent. Oh, he's popular with the people, sorry, I, but not, he's really stirring up the establishment. But what was really interesting was he actually caught the eye of Herod. Herod really liked this guy. There's something about you I really like. Yeah, but Herod, you took your brother's wife, and your brother's not dead. That's called adultery. Oh, oh, okay. You shouldn't have done that. Oh, okay, oops. Now, Herod's, um, Herod's brother's wife didn't like that. Deal with this man. I don't like what he's doing. So, he ends up in jail for quite a long time. I think, I think scripturally it might have even been like a year or something. There was quite a long period that he was in jail because Herod didn't want to hurt uh, John the Baptist, but eventually he was tricked by his partner into actually having him beheaded. But what happens now is the most interesting part. In the middle of sitting in jail, waiting for the Messiah to rise up with soldiers and swords and take Jerusalem and kick the Romans out and re-establish Jerusalem as, as, as the city on earth forever, John the Baptist is kind of feeling like he's rotting in jail here, and I've got a calling. I've got a mission, and I'm stuck here. Disciples come to visit him. He says, go and ask the Lord, are you the one, or do we wait for another? Now, I don't know about you, but I can feel a bit of, a bit of pain in that statement, maybe a bit of offense. You know, you know I'm rotting in jail here, Lord, any time. You know, come and rescue me. And then the Lord says, watch this, and does miracles in front of the disciples, and then says, go and tell them what you saw. The kingdom of God is being preached. And this is so important, because if we don't understand what the Lord is doing in our spiritual battles, we get isolated, like that. We start to think wrong about the Lord, and we start to get offended. And where's the answer? Because the Lord's quiet, silent. You can't hear him because of the wind. You can't hear him because of the, uh, the earthquake and the, and the fire. It's where we need each other. This is where each other comes in, and we turn to each other in our battle, and we support each other and love each other through that battle. And we remind each other, hey, the Lord's doing this because he's cleaning our lives up and going to bring you into a better peace and a better place. Okay, so 
before we close today, this idea of the storms in our life. Scripture today is teaching us, expect the Lord to be silent in your battle. Expect heaven to feel far away, but I don't want you to do this alone. Make sure you're in that fellowship. Make sure you stay there. That's where I am. Okay, and that's where you'll find my answer for you. And so here's our assignment for the month. I, if, you w if you wish. This is my suggestion, unless you want to do something else. Next time you find yourself in a spiritual crisis, pause and remind yourself of the Lord's plan and purpose to bring you lasting peace and joy. And the second step is to go find a passage of promise today or tomorrow. Begin to recite that daily in preparation for your next battle. Right? So Sacred Circle, last Sacred Circle, Chris Atkinson was mentioning how one of his favourite passages is Romans 8.28. For all things work out for good for those who love God and call according to his purposes. And then he said, and this is how I use it, when something goes wrong, I start saying to myself, what good exciting thing is now coming? Isn't that a great strategy? And you know he had a, a car accident recently. And the guy ran into him and wrote his car off. And he was perfectly unscratched. And then he got a payout. And he got more for the car than... I actually helped him buy the car about six, seven years ago. He got more for that car written off than what we paid for it back six, seven years ago. And he was like, wow. So there's one, he was like, there's one good thing. I wonder what else is coming. So there's this attitude that arms us and shields us in our battle and each other. Remember the term? The Roman settle? Each other. Turn each other. And so finally, <coughs> I want you to give some consideration this month to who your spiritual friends are that you can turn to in your times of spiritual battle. That's our assignment for the month. So I hope you've got something out of the message this morning. It's a beautiful message from Mark. You know, the Lord's going to keep us in fellowship, but we're going to expect storms, and we're going to see the Lord deliver us from those storms. Let's bow our heads and pray as we prepare to close the service. Dear Lord Jesus, may this word today from Mark stay with us. May we remember you in our battles. May we rest. May we find peace. May we cast fear out of our heart and shield ourselves with your promises that you are good and you have good for us. And let our victories, though they be many, met, let, let, let them be a testimony to you and let them be a witness to others of your goodness and let us also be there for others in their times of trouble. Amen. So can we sing a new commandment as we close the word today?
bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you this day and grant you his everlasting peace. Amen. So friends, have a time of coffee, tea and fellowship and uh, be there for each other. Amen.